This video will uh, be an overview of Chapter 10 in the AQA GCSE Biology Specification. So Chapter 10, B10, it's all about the nervous system. But it's important to actually think about how the nervous system can relate to the homeostasis mechanism in the entire body and how it works with other systems as well. So this is kind of an overview, drawing links to other chapters as well, but not necessarily going into minute detail in everything. So it's important that you go into detail on your own by looking at the textbook and other resources and making sure you're absolutely happy with all the details in within. So first of all, let's start off with thinking about what homeostasis actually is. Homeostasis is the maintenance of the internal environment relatively stable through negative feedback. Now, there are a couple of different things here. First of all, what does it mean by the internal environment? So internal environment is literally about uh, the changes within inside our body. So this could be, for example, uh, blood glucose level which you will learn, need to learn in a bit more detail in the next chapter. Uh, it could be about the body temperature as well, and also the water levels, which you will need to know in a bit more detail if you do the separate course. So these are the three specific examples of homeostasis that you need to be aware of and you need to learn about them. Then uh, the words negative feedback, right? Negative feedback is actually a mechanism which basically works in a way to reverse any changes experienced by the body. So what I mean by that is this. So for example, imagine if we draw a very quick graph, we've got time on the x-axis and then we've got blood glucose level on on the y-axis. So imagine if you have just eaten something, you just had a meal, so therefore your blood glucose level increases. But your body, it's bad to uh, carry, uh, carry on having a high blood glucose level, so therefore the body would release a hormone called insulin to bring it back down. And you haven't eaten in a while, so therefore your blood glucose level drops, so it gets a bit tired. Your body will then release another hormone called glucagon to bring it back up. So as you can see, this can carry on and it will become just a fluctuating graph. And the mechanism of trying to reverse any changes experienced by the body is called the negative feedback. Of course, we do have positive feedback, which is also very important in zoning cases, for example, childbirth and blood clotting. But for homeostasis, it's mainly going to be about the negative feedback system. And we say homeostasis is mainly controlled by two separate systems. We've got the nervous system, which is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this video, uh, and that is in B10. The other system they work along with will be the hormonal system, and that's in chapter 11. And a lot of cases is about how the nervous system first detects something, which then sends a signal uh, to the brain and the, and the coordinate center, which then sends a separate signal to the hormonal system to, uh, to allow them to also do their job. So there are two different things, so they work together. Uh, and like I said, it will have a lot of links to other chapters, so we'll see how we get on with. So first of all is to think about the general pathway uh, for uh, homeostasis and the nervous system. So the main thing is this one here. So first of all, we've got the stimuli or the stimulus. And uh, the stimulus is basically kind of those internal environments I've talked about. So it could be blood glucose level, body temperatures, water levels, or maybe even pain uh, or light in the eyes. So you can see it's all of those are stimuli. And they can be received by, they can be detected by different types of receptors. So for example, for the light in the eyes would be the photoreceptors in the retina, so the cone cells and rod cells, or pain receptors for reflex uh, responses, or any other receptors that can detect blood glucose level, temperatures, etc. So those are the receptors there. And then they will send a signal, uh, an, an electrical impulse through the sensory neuron. So the sensory neuron is the name of that particular nerve cell that would send a signal from the receptors to the coordination center because it's coordinating the senses, so therefore it's called the sensory neuron. And then the coordinate center, there are two main ones. So we've got the central nervous system, which can be branched off into uh, about the brain and the spinal cord. And both of them work together. So first of all, it gets the spinal cord, then it will shoot up to the brain, which then processes the signal, sends the signal back down to spinal cord and outwards towards the effectors. And the separate uh, neuron is called the motor neuron because they bring about the motion or the response. So then it gets the effectors and there are two types of effectors. We've got the muscles or it's either going to be the muscles or the glands. So for the muscles, it could be a movement. So for example, you just touch something really, really hot. So you just yank your hand away. That's relying on muscle contraction. Or it could be for blood glucose level. 
uh, you need to release a hormone so then it will signal the glands which then are the organs that actually release and make these hormones so that is all about uh, we'll talk more about that in the chapter 11 uh, section and then bring about the response which is whatever it is to reverse the mechanism or trying to change something and we say that sometimes in certain situations you need to have a very quick response then we got uh, the reflex arc and in the reflex arc within the spinal cord there is a relay neuron so uh, the sensory neuron was sent uh, the receptors uh, received a let's say you, you've just touched something really hot or really really painful it sends a signal to the re, uh, to the spinal cord uh, if it needs to send a separate signal to the brain then it takes a bit too long for it to process and comes back down Therefore, actually, we rely on the reflex arc, which is the signal goes literally right across the radial neuron and shoots back out to the motor neuron to yank your hand away. And then the spinal cord will send a separate signal to the brain telling your brain that you've just done this particular action. And between the different neurons, uh, there are actually structures called the synapses. And the synapses look a bit like this. So the synapse is basically talk about the gap between the neurons. So for example, if you've got a neuron and there's an impulse coming in, uh, and there is always going to be a gap between. But the thing is that electrical impulses cannot just jump across the gap. So therefore actually what happens is that when the nerve impulse comes in, they would trigger the release of chemicals called neurotransmitters. And these chemicals would diffuse across the synapse because going down the concentrated gradient to the other synapse, which has got receptors on the surface of the cell membrane. Once they receive these neurotransmitters, they will then trigger a second uh, nerve impulse and then it will go down the second uh, neuron. And this happens relatively quickly as well. So that's how the impulses can be transmitted or carried across uh, the different neurons. Now in terms of the combined cause, that is pretty much what you need to know right for chapter 10 but if you're doing the separate one you need to know a little bit more about the brain and the eyes which we'll talk a bit more now what you need to know about the brain is the general structure of it the different parts of it and also what they do so the brain can be separated into five different uh, stru major structures so these are the five structures the cerebral cortex the cerebellum the medulla the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland now the cerebral cortex is the main one, the big one. The, the, so this classic brain structure that you see, or brain diagrams you see, is pretty much the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex. And they are responsible for all of your conscious actions. So what that includes would be things like language, or intelligence, the fact that you can think and you can reason, your memories, uh, and also uh, emotions is all controlled by the cerebral cortex. Then we've got the cerebellum. They have a very specific function about coordinating your movements and it's about balance as well. So about the fact that you can actually stand on one leg or not is all about the cerebellum. And the medulla is responsible for all the unconscious actions. So for example, uh, regulating your heart rate and allowing you to breathe. Uh, you cannot, you obviously can hold your breath and stuff, but at one point you're going to have to breathe and that's your medulla kicking and going, you've got to stop breathing now. And also, as you would know, you cannot just mentally control and stop your heart from beating or make your heart go faster, but it's about this unconscious action uh, which keeps your heart going. Now, as for the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus is actually almost like a, a major receptor. It detects all the internal changes, so your body temperature, your blood glucose level, water levels, everything. And they also work very closely with the pituitary gland, which is also what we call the master gland because they release so many different types of hormones, which controls different things. So both of them actually have a major role uh, in terms of homeostasis and controlling what happens. So this is where the link exists, where we go from the nervous system into the hormonal system which we'll cover in B11. So it's about your body detecting some changes and then asking the hormonal system to kick in to take over. And that is all about the brain. You will need to know a little bit more about um, uh, brain therapy or about how do we use uh, brain surgery to, to find out how the brain works but that's again something that you have to go into a little bit more detail on your own. Then very quickly about the eyes, uh, you will need to know the structure of the eyes and then uh, something called a, a accommodation, which is about how our eyes actually change. 
to allow us to see things in front of us and see things that further away. And you also need to know some of the problems with the eyes and how we treat them. But here I'm just going to give a very quick overview. So I'm not going to talk about the structure of the eyes because that's something you've learned previously in um, when you were in year 7 or 8. But again, that's a bit more detail that you can learn a bit more on yourself. However, we need to focus on two specific structures for accommodation, which is the ciliary muscles and the suspensory ligament. So the ciliary muscles are attached to the suspensory ligaments and they're also attached to the lens. And what happens is about the uh, contraction or relaxation of the ciliary muscles. And actually together, if the ciliary muscles are contracting, they pull the suspensory ligament um, outwards. So it makes it, uh, it, it straightens it and tenses it up and therefore it flattens the lens so that it would change the focal length, changing the focal point on a retina. In the same way, if it is relaxing, then it, the suspensory ligaments are relaxed as well. The, then, uh, the lens becomes thicker, again changing the focal length. I'm sure you would have learned all about refraction in uh, physics, and this is literally about re uh, refraction. So that depending on the thickness of the lens, then you can change the angle of the refraction, and also then changing the angle of the, uh, well, changing the length of the focal length, and then therefore changing the point where the image actually focuses on the retina. So for someone with good eyes, that means that um, they can always make sure that the uh, image is focused right onto the surface of the retina. But sometimes people might have, uh, well, you know, we don't have to wear glasses because the, um, the focal point is different. So the, the image is focused before the retina or maybe sometimes in certain cases focused after the retina. And that's what you call short sightedness and long sightedness. In biology, we need to know the specific terms for them, which are myopia and hyperopia. Myopia is short sightedness. Uh, and hyperopia is long sightedness. So the treatment would be about, for example, uh, laser eye surgery, or sometimes you might, or the most common one, it is definitely going to be wearing glasses as well. Um, but the idea is about you need to know what type of lenses, what type of glasses they need to wear for the different situations, and the pros and cons of the different treatments that we have for treating myopia or hyperopia. So the eyes and the brains bit will be the separate content and together with the rest of the uh, previous bits I've talked about is the whole of chapter 10. So this is the overview for AKA GCSE, Biology, chapter 10, the nervous system.